Welcome to the Live Like It's True podcast. Here on the show, my guests and I talk through some of the most interesting and astonishing stories of the Bible, and then we ask, how can we live like this story is true? I'm your host, Shannon Pupkin. I am an author, a speaker, and a Bible teacher. And here on the podcast, I'm inviting you to think of these stories in the Bible as containers for truth. Each one gives you a new way to reject the lies, to rehearse the truth, and to invite other people to do the same. So I hope that this episode is going to inspire you to better know the story, share the story, and live like the story is true. Kent, welcome to Live Like It's True. Oh, I'm so happy to be on the air with you. <laughs> I am too. I just love you, Carol. You have been a sweet mentor to me and a friend over the years. Um, just so grateful for you and, and your life. Well, Shannon, I am watching what God is doing through your ministry, and it encourages me so much to see you encouraging others. And I just know both of us believe in raising up the next generation of Christian communicators who will indeed live like it's true. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think probably a dozen times on this podcast, we've started out by saying, I met you at the speak up conference. <laughs> it is it's so much a part of my ministry journey. Oh. You know, I think if you took out the speak up conference, my story would go a completely different way. So oh. you're just like what you have done. Tell us just, you know, give a, a minute to the speak up conference, what you're trying to accomplish with that. Well, I was teaching Bible study fellowship several years ago, and I knew God was bringing that to an end because I was going into retreating conference ministry. And the Lord put on my heart that there were women in the study who had a story to tell, or there were women who loved the Bible, but they didn't know how to dissect it and be able to come up with an outline and an aim for what they wanted their audience to do as a result of hearing a message. So I really launched this little group in my living room, and we began to share the basics of Bible teaching and sharing your own story. And out of that, I did not know that God was birthing a conference that we now do, uh, first of all, in churches all over the country, and now basically in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and virtually once a year. But it is the delight and joy of my life <laughs> to equip the next generation of speakers and writers. Well, and that has totally been my experience. I came to the Speak Up Conference. Uh, Cindy Bultima is the one who first invited me. And oh. I have experienced exactly what you just described. You know, like, I mean, I was teaching the Bible, but I feel like I've learned so many things there. Uh, um, you touch deeply, Shannon, because you're changing the world. Wow. God's word changes all of us. And that's, does, yeah. And, and he does call certain ones of us to take his message out into the world. So you have done that so beautifully. Um, and we're going to talk today about one of the most important stories in the Bible. I couldn't think of a better guest um, for this story. We're going to talk about Abraham laying Isaac down. You wrote a book. Oh, let me back up and just tell our guests may perhaps not know you. So let me read your bio here. Um, tell a little bit about you. You are a best selling author and international speaker for conferences, outreach events, and retreats. And you're the executive director of the conference we were just talking about. Uh, the Speak Up Conference, which is hosted in my hometown, Grand Rapids. I'm so lucky. I don't have to drive very far to get there. Um, I would. I would drive far to get there. <laughs> you have been training us, Christian speakers, for 25 years. You've been featured on Women of Faith, Extraordinary Women, Women of Joy, uh, Arena events. And you're the author of over 25 books. And now that I've written some books myself, I know all of the blood, sweat, and tears that represents 25 sure. <laughs> books, Carol. And that includes your best selling book, When I Lay My Isaac Down. And that's the one we're really going to. Yes focus on that book, I think is you've written several subsequent books, right? I have, um, yes. Yeah. To tell this story um, of laying your Isaac down. So we're going to weave in your story mm -hmm. with this, you know, story in the Bible, but I kind of thought it would be fun 
to start out with a little fun, loving story that I, I'd love to tell you about my daughter. And as I'm doing that, I'd love for you to follow up and tell us something fun about your son when he was a little kid. Give us give us a snapshot of who Jason, your son that I've now prayed for for years, you oh, know, who you. he was. But my daughter is now 25. When she was two one day, I was reading her this story we're going to talk about, about Abraham laying down his son, Isaac. And after I told her the story, I said, Lindsay, God wanted to know whether Abraham loved God more or his son, Isaac more. And I said to her, Lindsay, who did Abraham love most? And she, with a serious little face, she said, God, Abraham loved God the most. And and then I said to her, well, Lindsay, who do you love the most? And she kind of smiled and looked down shyly. And she said, Chad. (laughs) Chad was a little three-year-old boy from our church who had stolen her little two-year-old heart. And she just loved him. He made her giggle. Oh, I love it. I know. I think probably Lindsay is just a little more honest than the rest of us. But but do you have a fun story? I I would love to. (laughs) Our son was born with a twinkle in his eye, and he was really a delight to raise. And in one of his early pictures, he's in a sailor suit, and he really did grow up to be in the Navy. So he was a lover of water. But I was on a speaking trip and it was my first time to be away from him for three days. And I came home and he came running for me and I swept him up in my arms and we twirled around and he said, mommy, mommy, when I saw you right now, it was just like I saw you brand new. Oh, and to me, that was just like God sees us through oh. his son's precious blood on Calvary. Mm. And no matter what we've done or how many wrong turns we've made or bad choices, he sees us as brand new mm. when we our sin and come back to him. So that to me was one of those instant illustrations for a lifetime. Love it. Yeah. How old was he at that point? He would have probably been four years old. Four years old. So yeah. that's when you began speaking is when he was just a little boy, right? Well, and even a little bit before that. So okay. I've probably been doing some luncheons and okay. a few retreat workshops, but then it began to expand greatly. I think I may have mentioned this episode is going to be wrapping up a series that we are doing on the life of Sarah. Uh And this coincides with a book that I'm releasing called Shaped by God's Promises. Uh, It's a Bible study on the life of Sarah. And in the book, I didn't really get to dive deeply into this story of Abraham that we're going to talk about today. I did wrap up the book though with the story because it just can't, you can't talk about Sarah without including this story. It's such an important story about tests that God does put us through. So um, let me just, I'm just going to kind of break the story into several pieces. We'll talk about the story. We'll talk about your story and kind of weave them together underneath the grand overarching story of God's narrative. So this story, it comes from Genesis 22. I'm looking at it in the NIV translation, and it starts out by sometime later. We're not sure how much later, so we're not exactly sure how old Isaac is at this point. Probably a young man, would you say? I would say. Yeah. So it says sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am. Abraham replies, and God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. I mean, what is surprising here, Carol? (laughs) Shocking. Absolutely shocking. It seems irrational. It's irresponsible. It does not seem like what a good parent would do. And so everything about it just makes you think, what on earth is God asking Abraham to do? Yes. And I mean, what stood out to me was this idea of an altar. Like I have never uh, actually seen a real altar. I haven't actually watched a burnt offering. I, I mean, I think there's something 
grueling about that. I haven't, I haven't seen an animal die in my place. There is a somberness to this that I, you know, we talk about laying things on the, on the altar, but I was really gripped with the somberness of what God has just asked Abraham to do. It is totally sobering and it, it almost sucks the air right out of you because it's such a big request and it's, and it doesn't seem like a good request. And sometimes we think, Lord, are you really in this? God, what, what are you saying? What do you really mean? And so we ask ourselves so many questions when we hit the, the really tough things. There are so many things in the Bible that don't seem true to God's character. And then we have to ask ourselves, well, here God is revealing his character to us. So we come Mm -hmm. to the Bible, not, we need to work through these assumptions. But in this particular story, I mean, this is the child, the promised child. Yes. You know, of all the families of the world, God has chosen this particular family and has promised Abraham from you will come a great nation. Yes. And this is the son that God has promised. And miraculously, I mean, at 90 years old, Sarah has given birth to this baby after a lifetime of infertility. This is all of the promises. Yes. And the beginning of the race of Israel. So yeah. this is huge. So why would God be saying, oh, I gave you this, this child, this miracle, but now I want you to sacrifice this child. Nothing about it makes sense humanly. Nothing makes sense. So when I think about your story mm-hmm. and how God asked you to put your son mm on an altar. What parallels do you see? What tell it, just tell us what happened. Yeah, okay. Well, we raised our son in a Christian home and he was a delight to raise Shannon. Uh, he was fun loving. He went on youth group trips and missions trips. And he was someone who gave to needy causes. Mm-hmm. And so we, we loved hanging out together. He's our only child. So we really did spend a lot of time with him. And I remember he went off to camp between his sophomore and junior years of high school. And it was Summit Ministries in Manitou Springs, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And he came back and he said, mom and dad, I really believe that God wants me to serve in military and maybe even in political leadership. And I believe the best place I could get trained to do that would be at the U.S. Naval Academy. Well, he finally got the appointment to the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis. And we were there in May of 1997 when all of those midshipmen tossed those hats in the air and we Mm -hmm. celebrated our young son's accomplishments. Well, Shannon, from there, he went to nuclear engineering school in Orlando, Florida, joined a great church that had a big Bible study. And there were girls in that Bible study. And Jason got very interested in studying the Bible. But (laughs) he met a girl and uh, we called home for messages. And on voicemail, he said, Mom and Dad, some things are coming down. We have to talk. It's at a moment like that. You wish your child would add two or three more sentences about what is coming. (laughs) And uh, we got a hold of him later. He said, my orders have changed. I have to be at surface warfare officer school in Newport, Rhode Island on September 8th. April and I are in love and we want to get married so we can go together. And we want to get married next Friday. Shannon, that was a shock. Okay. (laughs) I couldn't believe my only child was asking to marry a previously married woman with two children, someone we had never met next Friday. And I I very quickly realized we had a choice. He was in love. He was getting married. We could either choose to get on board or we could cause a rift that just might last a lifetime. So we asked them if they would be married with the accountability of family and friends around them in our then hometown of Port Huron, Michigan, and they agreed. And a week and a half later, April and these two precious girls, six-year-old Chelsea and three-year-old Hannah, entered our lives. And we loved these girls instantly. Little Chelsea came up to me 30 minutes after she got in and she grabbed my hand and her two hands kissed all over it. And she said, Aww. you're my new favorite Grammy. Aww. Oh, that made me feel so special. 
Little Hannah would sit at my kitchen counter every morning and in between her bites of cereal, she would sing songs about how much she loved Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we had a beautiful wedding on a picture perfect day. And if you could see them with Jason in his navy whites and April in her dress from a resale shop, you would say it looks like we're living in a story that should end. And they lived happily ever after. But there were things happening. Uh, there were multiple allegations of abuse involving the biological father of the girls. And he had been given only supervised visitation. And he was behaving very well during supervision. And Jason was about to get his orders. And he knew this man was about to get unsupervised visitation. Jason's orders were for Hawaii, which would mean six-week visits with the father alone with little girls. And he did not trust this man based on the extraordinary allegations of abuse of the past. And in retrospect, we began to see our son unravel mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And we had been in St. Louis for a ministry weekend. We came home on a Sunday night. We were tired and we were sound asleep. And the phone rang. I remember looking at the clock. It said 12.35 a.m. And Jean picked up the phone and I saw this look of shock and horror come over his face. He said, Carol, Jason has just been arrested for the murder of his wife's first husband. He's in the jail in Orlando. And I had nausea sweep over me. I tried to get out of bed. My legs would not hold my weight. I literally crawled my way into the office. I finally grabbed the phone and I got a number for the Orlando jail. And when someone eventually answered and I asked about my boy, a rude voice on the other end of the line said, lady, we ain't got nobody by that name in this jail. Lady, your son ain't here. And for just a minute, my hope returned. Mm -hmm. But Shannon, as hour followed hour, the facts of the case were confirmed. Our son had pulled a trigger in a public parking lot and a man had died. And we began our journey into what we call our new kind of normal. We went through two and a half years and seven postponements of Jason's case before he was eventually convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. And Shannon, I think about this story of Abraham that we're focusing on today. And I remember Jean flew to Florida very early while I was pulling the last of the finances together to pay for the attorney. And it felt like a mortgage for a house. It was a criminal defense of gigantic magnitude. And I, I remember the phone rang. And it was a digitized message asking me if I would accept a call. And when I did, my son was on the phone and he was sobbing. He said, Mom, I've just been jumped by 10 inmates. They were kicking me and kicking me in the head. He said, my two front teeth have been broken off. He said, I have a cut in, in the ear. He said, I'm really messed up, Mom. They stole all my stuff except for my Bible. But he said, after the beating, the corrections officers took me to the faith-based area of the jail. And he said, Mom, those men were like Jesus to me. They washed my wounds. They gave me a clean T-shirt. They prayed over me. They were just like Jesus, Mom. And before I knew it, that call ended and it was cut off automatically. And I remember sitting at my desk with this guttural wail coming out of me. And I said, God, I cannot do this journey. Lord, please take me home to be with you. I cannot watch my son suffer like this. Please, God. And I, I just cried cried out to the Lord. Well, I got on a plane the next day and I went for my first visit with my son. Gene had already had his allowable 15 minute visit with our son. So he was not allowed to come with me. And I remember the long wait for him to come and there was a shuffle and I was used to seeing him in naval uniforms, but he was in jailhouse blues and his face was covered with scabs. And I saw a big cut in his ear. Both of his eyes were fully bloodshot. And then I saw those broken off front teeth. And for several moments, all I could do was just sob. And finally, I spoke up. There was a corrections officer behind him listening to everything we said. And I just said, Jason Paul Kent, there is nothing you could ever do that would stop my unconditional love for you, son. Your dad and I are here for you. 
Well, Shannon, the visit was very short. I went back out to the parking lot and I couldn't drive because I was crying too hard. And I I just remember Genesis 22 coming back to me. And I'm a, a firstborn preacher's kid. You know, that makes me bossy. And I won all the Bible memory contests because I'm very driven and perfectionistic. And I, I remember I knew this story really well. And I thought, you know, it was a three-day journey to Mount Moriah. And I, I was thinking about Abraham saying, couldn't we have a do-over here, God? I mean, this is this is not a good plan. Nothing about this is a good plan. But the Bible says Abraham got up early the next morning to make the trip to Mount Moriah. Doesn't that shock you, Shannon? It does. I, it blows my mind that he would get up early knowing that the object of the sacrifice is his son on the altar. And I'm thinking, how could he walk beside his son for those three days, knowing the object of the whole trip was right. to give his son up to God on an altar? And uh, I I think about where it, it says that young Isaac looked up. And he said, Dad, we have the wood and we have the fire, but Dad, where is the lamb? And I think about myself in that place wondering, you know, Lord, you know, this just is more than you should ever ask of anybody. This this is too hard. And, and it says that Abraham said, God will provide the lamb. Wow. And and there was a lamb in the bushes. We know the end of this story. And we know that Isaac was not eventually the one to be put on the altar, but it was a test of faith for Abraham. And I want to quickly say, Shannon, that my son is no Isaac. Isaac had done nothing wrong that merited the sacrifice. My son had taken the life of a human being. And I was, I just want people to know that I was identifying with Abraham, the parent who needed to relinquish everything, including what I loved most to the God who loved Jason represented by Isaac in my mind more than I did, which was overwhelming to me to think of relinquishing what I loved most to the God who loved my child more than I did. Is that even possible? Mm. And uh, he, he really laid his Isaac down. Mm. Oh man, Carol, this story, it is heavy. It is every mother's just the antithesis of our dream for our children. Mm. Uh, it's God has asked a lot of you and I do see a parallel. Like the only thing in this story about Abraham that makes sense or that helps make sense of it to me is in that first verse where it says that God tested Abraham. Mm -hmm. Like this was a test. It, it doesn't yeah. align with God's character. It was incongruent with yes. everything he knew. And, and I see that in your story also, like this is, incongruent. Why would God allow this? Why would he ask this of you? Why would he put you through this situation? But I do see him asking of you a test, you know, putting a test before you. Yeah. That thing about uh, Abraham rising early in the morning. I wonder if it's just because he couldn't sleep, you know? Uh, oh, that's a good thought. Yes. Like, let's just get, I can't, I can't sleep. You know, yeah. he lost a night's sleep. On the road. I imagine you lost lots of sleep. Oh, yes. We spent that whole first night uh, sobbing intermittently. And my husband, Gene, and I would hold each other. And then we would start a list of everything that needed to be done, people who needed mm -hmm. to be contacted. And our whole income was ministry at that point in our lives. Gene had left his job in the insurance business to go on the road with me one year before this happened. Oh. And I thought, who will want the mother of a murderer on their platform? I thought, we will have no way to make a living. We will have no way to pay for an attorney. And it just, it was so mind boggling. I could hardly comprehend it all. Oh, 
God's promises are like a set of parentheses. The first one is when he makes the promise. The second one is when he keeps it. And you never have one without the other. But often there's this long stretch between the two, much longer than we first imagined, right? That's what we see in Sarah's story found in Genesis 12 through 21. God promised a son, but in this wide stretch between the parentheses, she wondered, would God keep his promises? Could he? I'm Shannon Popkin, inviting you to come find the answer to those questions, both for Sarah and yourself, in my brand new six-week Bible study titled Shaped by God's Promises, Lessons from Sarah on Fear and Faith. Find out how you too can be shaped by God's promises in the waiting. And I imagine it was a bit isolating. Like I noticed the part in the story where Abraham says to his servants, you guys stay here with the donkey and I'm going to go with the boy. Like there are some places, so, some tests that are so agonizing. We we have to kind of go alone. Did you experience that? Yes. I, I wanted to curl up in the embryo p- position and just not go outside. I didn't know who knew my story because we start to read body language and if eyebrows are raised people are looking at us weirdly, or we walk into a church and we think, oh no, they're looking. They've heard, haven't they? And the news hadn't come out in our hometown papers yet. And I just remember facing the public with such fear. And uh, one day I just looked out my door before I answered it. And it was the florist. And I opened the door and the the man said, "Um, hey, lady, are you Carol Kent? I said, yes, I am. He said, lady, it's your lucky day. Well, Shannon, I wanted to tell him to go make somebody else's day lucky. I was not in the mood. But when you're depressed about all you can do is respond. And he handed me one dozen beautiful yellow roses, the most beautiful I had ever seen. And I wondered who had graced my day with these beautiful flowers. And I opened the note and it was from two of my sisters. It said, Dear Carol, you once gave us some decorating advice. You told us that yellow flowers will brighten any room. We thought you needed a little yellow in your life right now. Love, Bonnie, and Joy. Shannon, I had never been so needy, but I had never felt so loved. And little gestures like that began to calm my heart and to make me know there would be a close circle of people who would still embrace me, even if a whole lot of people wondered what was wrong with my parenting Mm -hmm. and what was wrong with my spirituality that I couldn't raise a son who would have made more positive choices. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I imagine that Abraham, I mean, what he is contemplating here is not going to be understood mm-hmm. by the the random bystander. And so, you know, he's he's got these two servants with him, but like, they're not going to understand. No. Like, he, no. you stay back. This is a journey I have to take. But I, I mean, I love that you had, you had some who were there for you. And yet this was really a journey that you and Jean before the Lord had to take really with your son. Yes. And, and so as we see Abraham continuing on, uh, you know, it was interesting as I read this story afresh this morning, Carol, when I read about the part where it says, um, you know, you, you briefly mentioned it. it says that Abraham took the wood for the offering and he puts the wood on Isaac and he's carrying the fire and the knife Abraham is. And then the two of them are walking together. And Isaac asks that question, father, yes, my son, Abraham replies, the fire and the wood are here, but where's the lamb? Mm-hmm. And Abraham answers, God will provide a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. When I read that section, I thought, you know what? This isn't actually necessary to the plot of the story. It's like we could we could skip this part yes. and, you know, the story would still go on, this little interaction between Abraham and his son. But I mean, this is high drama here. Oh, it's this, high drama. This is our storyteller is from a storytelling perspective, what he's doing is he's creating tension. Mm-hmm. Like we, the the observers know that Abraham has in mind what he's going to do. And Isaac doesn't know. And this is like the tension is drawn yeah. out, you know, in my book shaped by God's promises, I talked about how God's promises are like a set of parentheses. You know, you have the promise and then you have God keeping his promise. Like they always come in pairs. Yeah. Uh, and what we would like is 
you know, for those to be held nice and tight, <laughs> like right immediately, God keeps yeah. his promises. But what happens is these parentheses, they get stretched out. Yes. And sometimes what you have in the Bible is you have the promise, you have the first parenthesis, yes. and there's this tension mm-hmm. of this drawn out, like we know God is faithful. We know his, he keeps his promises, but it doesn't look like it here no. in this moment. And that's what I see in your story too. Like as you lived out this high drama situation with your son, you had no idea how God was going to get you through this. What do you make of that? What's, what's interesting about that? It was something that was so specific to me when I was studying the passage that you just referred to is that it, it says he bound his son and he laid him on the altar. And I know you and I both love studying biblical meanings of words, Shannon. And the verb form for laying your Isaac down actually means a lifting up. So in other words, laying his Isaac down was a supreme act of high worship. It was a lifting up. And to me, that was an aha moment in that passage. It was like to relinquish control of my son in my situation. And I know Abraham had to do that, but it was if saying, Lord, this is my heart sacrifice. This is what I need to do to lift my son up. And and Shannon, I, I started to think, what does that look like? What does a heart sacrifice look like? Well, it's to identify something precious to us. Mm -hmm. So we might ask every one of our listeners today, what is precious to you? So precious that you cling to it and it's hard to let go of. And it's letting go of our control over the situation, event, or person as an act of worship. Wow. I I think God had to pry my hands open. I mean, I was not just willingly saying, oh, Lord, you know, I just give you my son and it's okay if he's in prison for life. And in in Florida, there's the death penalty. We were, it felt like everything was on the altar. It was so frightening. And it is to embrace God's love in the process of letting go. Isn't that just amazing? Imagine what Abraham had to go to, to say, Lord, I trust you. You love my son enough that I can embrace your love in the process of letting go and lifting up this sacrifice, which is my son, an act of worship. Well, friends, we're going to return next time with Carol Kent and hear more of her story. But uh, as we close right now, I just want to pose that question that Carol presented. Is there a, a way that God is asking you to lay down your Isaac? Is there some person or situation or outcome that's just precious to you? And how is God asking you to open your hands and lift up your sacrifice before him today? Not because you're convinced that everything's going to turn out just the way you hoped, but because you trust God and you trust his perspective more than your own. I'd love to invite you to pick up a copy of Carol Kent's book, When I Lay Down My Isaac. She goes into her story in far more detail and tells just all the things that God has done through this very painful and difficult situation. I'd also love for you to consider my new Bible study, Shaped by God's Promises, Lessons from Sarah on Fear and Faith. And our next episode is the last one in this Sarah series. So I wonder if there's somebody you need to invite in, somebody who is going through a hard time, who's being asked to lay down their Isaac. Will you invite them to listen to this episode and maybe let them know about the one to come? I can't wait for you to hear all of the rich truths and lessons Carol has for us next time. Can I just remind you that each of these stories from the Bible is absolutely true. Rather than giving us a list of facts to memorize about himself, God gave us a book filled with stories, and each one helps us to know him and to understand this overarching story that we are all in. So I hope that you'll take some time looking at this story in your Bible. 
To help you study, I've put together my free Live Like It's True workbook, which includes my false narratives watch list, my story elements bookmark, and more. Live Like It's True is part of the Resound Podcast Network. For more gospel-centered resources, visit resoundmedia.cc. We've got that link for you, along with links to any of the other resources that we've mentioned in the show notes. Thanks so much for joining me. And now it's time to go live like it's truth.